Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Ipshita Chanda and I teach comparative literature at the English and Foreign Languages University at Hyderabad. This paper is on new literatures in English and the module we will now enter is called Displaced Voices. We will talk about the literature of the refugees and the migrants. What is this module about? This module charts the contemporary writings emerging from the experiences of exile and displacement suffered by refugees and undocumented migrants. In the world today, we are witnessing huge global flows of forced migration, particularly stemming from West Asia and North Africa. Some of these writings from these regions are going to be considered in this module. We are living in an age of forced migration. Presently, there are 65.3 million forcibly displaced people in the world, according to UN estimates, which are seen to be rather modest. In the current decade itself, an estimated 11 million people have been recently displaced in Syria alone, 6.6 .6 million within the country and 4.8 million seeking refuge in other countries. These are people undertaking harrowing journeys across international borders and front lines of myriad conflicts to reach a putative place of safe haven, albeit an illusory place, where they can recuperate from the trauma, account for their losses and embark on a recreation of their lives. They might imagine a new diasporic myth of return or reconceive a new home things which refugees are expected to do. Meanwhile, their arrivals have been greeted by renewed xenophobia in their targeted destinations. European states are busy juggling the migrants' legitimate asylum rights. Consequently, the refugees' journey seems unending. The exodus becomes an unending sojourn on the road. The consequent loss of belongings, of loved ones, and previous local moorings make the refugee camps the site of new contestations for resources and memories. In June, June 2016, a group of migrant artists collaborated with native European writers and artists for an exhibition called Call Me By My Name, Stories from Calais and Beyond. Calais is a town on the French Channel coast and remains the largest refugee staging ground in Western Europe. The drawings, poems and short sketches of dislocation that were collected for this endeavor reiterates Salman Rushdie's observation in his 1991 piece, Imaginary Homelands. Rushdie says, the migrant reflects the predicament of the 20th century human being. Bereft of belongings, the migrant can only cling on to her memory and try to refashion it. It is a resistant attempt to reclaim one's own history in the face of constant attempts of effacement. Thus, the new literature of refugees and undocumented migrants is a constitutive part of our globalized cultural present. Let us look at the conceptual issue of refugees and undocumented migrants. Every refugee is technically a migrant. However, the term refugee comes with certain legal guarantees. Notably, the 1951 Refugee Convention states, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and he is unable, he, and he is unable to or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. The convention makes it binding for the signatory countries to provide social security to refugees who live within their boundaries. Hence, we have the constant bickering regarding the status of the newly arrived person's situation of deprivation. Is he a refugee who has the right to social security in the country of refuge? Signatory states continuously try to downplay the forced migrants' plight, denoting them as usual migrants, 
supposedly embarking on a free and voluntary journey and therefore not entitled to the social security that the Refugee Convention mandates for them. This tendency is reciprocated by the countries of the origin of the migrants, which try to deny acts of targeted discrimination against their fleeing population. Hence, these people are often placed in a position of legal liminality, of marginality, and in the absence of a better term can be called the undocumented migrants. The representation of loss found in the forced migrants' writings is thus itself an act of claiming a respectable legal and political subjecthood. As Warson Shire writes in her poem, Home, you have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than land. It should be noted that literature of the refugees and of undocumented migrants is not typologically distinct group of literary practice, but an axis of the migrant writer's subjects ascribed position. It is constantly deliberative and discursively mediated. Displacement, refugees and literature. Displacement and forced migration have been recurrent themes of literature since antiquity. Virgil's Aeneas flees an ancient war in West Asia and crosses the Mediterranean in search of safety from the burning towers of Troy. He eventually finds it in Italy and founds the dynasty that would later spawn the Roman Empire. Startling as it might be for some, the roots of European civilization, which go back to the Roman Empire, therefore stem in part from the story of the refugee Aeneas. In fact, one of the foundational books of European civilization, the Bible, is replete with themes of dislocation and banishment. The book of Exodus is an obvious example. Amongst the Gospels, the first Gospel of Luke portrays the infant Jesus as a kind of migrant, shunned by the innkeepers of Bethlehem and seeking asylum. In depicting Jesus' escape from King Herod, the Gospel of Matthew later highlights the family's flight into Egypt. Some of the stalwarts of modern Western culture were refugees. Marx and Engels were refugees. So were Vladimir Nabokov, Bertolt Brecht, Walter Benjamin and Theodore Adorno. Two world wars, violent and myopic nationalisms and innumerable localized strifes have made refugees an enduring testament of the failures of the modern state system and of the vitiated relation between states in the modern world. Art and literature represent this failure, this vitiation and the human results. A look at the iconic 1980s cartoon series Moss by Art Spiegelman discloses the pains of dislocation the preceding European generations went through. Beneath its inimitable graphic style, Moss is a poignant interview of Spiegelman's father, a Polish Jew and a Holocaust survivor. The most pervasive theme in science fiction narrative has actually been the story of refugees. Refugees flee from planetary destruction, war, or just from overcrowding and ecological destruction. Superman, for example, gets sent to safety when his home planet Krypton is destroyed. It is no coincidence that Superman is also the poster boy for assimilation. His real family are the Kents of Kansas, and he thinks of himself not as a Kryptonian, but as an American. He gets to live the refugee's dream, being totally accepted into the prosperous new world of his new home. Plus, he is physically and mentally superior to everyone else around him in his new home. He is the embodiment of the melting pot of America. His creators, Siegel and Schuster, were the sons of poor Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, mainly Lithuania and Ukraine. So perhaps their dreams of assimilation into their home in America was the quintessential refugee's dream. Doctor Who has the same alien world story as Superman, but without the assimilation. 
There are also many characters who flee a doomed or destroyed earth, including Arthur Dent in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. John Varley's novels frequently take place in a universe where humans have been forced to flee an earth invaded by aliens and have colonized the rest of the solar system as a result. Every eco-disaster narrative or post-apocalyptic story includes some kind of refugee motive, with people fleeing the destroyed cities or trying to find a safe heaven, like The Day After Tomorrow, The Postman, Waterworld or Mad Max, or Stephen Gold's no novel Blind Waves. The Martian attacks in the War of the Worlds spawns a huge fleet of refugee ships running away from the carnage. Islanders flee rising sea levels only to drown or wind up in a horrible refugee, sorry, only to flee or wind up in horrible refugee boat camps in the 202 young adult novel called Exodus. This is also the name of a novel of the Jewish diaspora and the armed struggle for Israel written by Leon Uris. Said and Olausen propose a new paradigm of representation that is needed to represent the lives of refugees. Whether mediatized or articulated through literature, the refugee is far from representing himself or herself. Rather, they are represented by others. The obvious pattern of refugees can be glimpsed from media representations that turn the refugee problem into a spectacle where migrants attempt to reach Europe in overloaded boats, often failing and sometimes dying in the process. Let us consider the refugee as a theme written by non-refugees. In the last two decades, there has been a proliferation of representation of refugee experience by non-refugees. The significant point of departure of these writings from previous representations of displacement is that whereas the earlier representations in English and other Western literatures had been of white European refugees, whether they were Jews or anti-communists reaching the presumed bastions of freedom and fighting refugees in Western liberal democracy, in the new writings, these figures are mostly non-Europeans, possibly West Asians or Africans escaping totalitarian regimes and dirty wars engineered by the West for natural resources like oil and for power over the other, represented often by another religious group and the civilization that that religion spawns. Dave Eggers' What is the What? is a racy narrative of escaping wars and attended privations of feeling. It is based on the life and true story of the Sudanese refugee Valentino Ashak Deng, who walked thousands of miles to escape the violence always surging in his wake. He found struggle and squalor in refugee camps and eventually came to the US as part of the Lost Boys of Sudan program. Of course, only to find that his problems were far from over. His second novel, continuing the same narrative, is The City of Thorns. For all Europe's panic about the recent wave of migrants, City of Thorns underlines how the vast majority of the world's 60 million displaced never leave the hellholes of their homes like Dadaab. Chris Cleave's Little Bee is a popular novel about the plight of a young Nigerian refugee and the English woman whose life she changes when she shows up after two years behind razor wire in a detention center after their first horrific meeting on an African beach. Michael Chabon's The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay is not a refugee text because Michael Chabon is no refugee, but Joe Cavalier is and his story was the most compelling and most memorable part of this popular novel. Joe lands in New York City as a 19-year-old Jewish refugee from Nazi-occupied Prague and he spends the entirety of the book trying to get his family, in 
particular his little brother to safety in America. The Uninvited by Jeremy Harding takes the Balkan Wars as the backdrop for an account of migration in and to Europe in the late 90s. Combining forensic reportage, elegiac writing and sharp meditations on the history of migration, Harding documents the popular routes between Albania and Italy and Morocco and Spain before exploring the asylum systems people encountered on arrival in Europe. However, if we need to understand the place of refugees and other dislocated subjects in our modern world, then we need to conceptually differentiate between the representation of the forced migrant by the non-migrants and the forced migrants' own mode of self-representation. So we may turn to the literatures written by migrants and refugees themselves. Leela Abdul Razak's Badawi is a personal, political, graphic novel based on the stories of Abdul Razak's father, which he told her about growing up in a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. She incorporates Palestinian iconography and art in a striking coming-of-age story that began as a webcomic. The author's eye for detail makes her father's youth a period piece of an era just 30 years removed by calendar, but striking in its representation of a youth so different from our expectations today. Purushista Khakpur's The Last Illusion is an Iranian refugee story. Khakpur is now a US citizen. She wrote in CNN recently that her feelings about the recent orders given by Trump cabinet regarding refugees remind her of the thoughts she had after 9-11. What is going to happen to this country, she asks. What will they do to my other country? You can be a refugee once, I've always thought, but how to be one twice? This novel, The Last Illusion, tells the story of another kind of refugee, an Iranian boy raised, raised as a bird in a birdcage eating bugs, who is adopted by an American psychologist and brought to New York to try to become a man and maybe after all this time to leave the cage and learn how to fly. Mm -hmm. Khaled Hussain, Hosseini's The Kite Runner was an American bestseller from West Asia. Khaled Hosseini came to the United States with his family in 1980 seeking asylum during the Soviet Afghan war. The protagonist of his best-selling first novel follows a similar path, growing up in Kabul before escaping to Pakistan and then California during the war before going back to rescue his best friend's son from an orphanage. Viet Than Yugen was born in Vietnam and came to America as a refugee in 1975, landing first in a refugee camp in Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, and eventually moving to San Jose. His 2015 novel, The Sympathizer, won the Pulitzer Prize and is a sharp collection of stories focused largely on the lives of Vietnamese exiles in California. Goodbye Sarajevo by Atka Reed and Hannah Schofield is written 70 years after the Second World War. It is tempting to see the refugee experience as something that happens to people who aren't from Europe. So, Goodbye Sarajevo is an important counterpoint, the true story of a family trapped in the besieged city during the Balkan Wars of the 90s. Written jointly by the two sisters, Atka and Hana, it is a moving reminder that war and displacement can disturb even the calmest of middle-class lives. Ishmael Bia, who wrote A Long Way Gone in 2007, offers a rare chance to see war from, through the eyes of a child soldier, brainwashed and kept obedient with drugs and guns. But the bleakness of this account is also tempered with the redemption at the end, where Ishmael, writing his memoir, talks about the way he gets out of this situation. 
The very act of reading as he tells the story of his past is an indication that a nightmare like this can and perhaps will end. The poetry of forced migration, the attendant dislocation of forced migration, seldom leaves the refugee with the resources, leisure and mental calmness to embark upon their books. Thus, often the first muse of the refugee's art is the poetic muse. It is a form suited to represent their fragmented, tentative and insecure predicament while waiting for that elusive notice of inclusion in the wastelands of modern nation-states. The Calais exhibition that we discussed brings forth countless poems, often scribbled defiantly against the law as graffiti on compound walls. There is a proliferation of short, poignant verses and lyrics emerging from these voices. We can mention the Malian refugee Aziz Abrahimi or the Palestinian Arab writer Rafif Ziada working from London. Her poems like Hadil, Shades of Anger, We Teach Life Sir, have done more for highlighting the plight of the dispossessed of Gaza than any UN or Arab League resolution. We have also seen the poem Home by Warsan Shire, which became an internet sensation recently. Its few dozen lines provide the best summary of what drives refugees to risk their lives at sea. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You run only for the border when you see the whole city running as well. In her poem Here and There, Suzanne Mohammed from Kurdistan describes the sense of alienation in the so-called new home, that is England, and her aspirations for the journey back to her native country. My steps are dragging me along the road, my remote imagination demanding an inspiration. I used to find inspiration by the sun, the moon, the sea and the sky. Even the walls of my bedroom were inspiring. At the end of the poem, the poet confesses, I am an unfinished portrait, left shuttered in the middle of nowhere. Or perhaps I am a lost individual, left divided between here and there. This is an aspect of liminality described by Victor Turner. Turner says this is woven into the narratives of forced migration through the use of languages and images of confusion, where the sense of exile and exhaustion creates an uncanny sense of being in between. The sentiment of longing is repeatedly articulated in narratives by refugees, as in the case of this poem, In the Name of Kabul, written by Behrang Kodomani, an Afghan refugee. My presence is here, but my heart is in the alleyways of Kabul. My tongue utters its name. My lips sing a song of Kabul. The dream of returning is often met with insurmountable problems. Deterritorialization can hardly be achieved because the emphasis is placed on the old territory that is called home. Hint, Hilton Mendelssohn enquires in another African catastrophe why he cannot now hear those voices and see those men and women who fought against apartheid to free the country from the new colonial native. Another African Catastrophe by Hilton Mendelssohn. Born out of apathy, black men and women will always talk and talk, bring up apartheid and slave boats and exploitation by white folks. But what about when it is our own? The poem addresses the reasons behind the phenomenon of mass refugification in the world today. These are poems written mostly in that moment, albeit a long and unending moment of flight. We might not find the gathered reflective pathos of second generation migrants like Lee Young Lee or an earlier Carlos Samara. That reflection might follow that once that harrowing moment of dispossession is passed and recollected, 
in tranquility. In this module, we have seen a brief overview of the present writings about and by refugees. We have distinguished the differences between migrants and their representations, whether by themselves or by sympathetic others. In a world of increasing displacement, the forced migrants' quest for social, moral and ontological stability might be the quest of humanity in general in the late modern world. It is this quest for stability that spawns the new literatures written by migrants and refugees.